Our dear Heavenly Father, we come before you right now just wanting to praise and thank you for the blessed Sabbath day, to praise you for your leading and guiding, that we may be able to, though far apart, draw close together here on earth and to our Father in heaven and our Savior. As we study the word today, I ask that you will open our understandings that we may see clearly and understand that we be not deceived in the many winds of doctrines. We come to you now in the most holy place, presenting our plea in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we're going to be studying the two laws in the New Testament. The two laws in the New Testament. Now this subject is an extremely important subject because if we misunderstand this subject, we will have some issues in our doctrines. And then the enemy who seeks to destroy will have gained that success that he is looking for. By not having a correct view of this subject, many have stumbled and have been kept from keeping, uh, from the keeping of the Sabbath. And then they go on and accept many errors of men. They as well have been confused and fallen for the lie of the enemy to go back into the keeping of the ceremonial laws that were fulfilled at the death of our Savior. Now it is my object today to show that the word law in the New Testament does not apply to one and same law. But sometimes it applies to the ceremonial laws of Moses and sometimes to the moral law of God, the Ten Commandments. If the word law, so used by Paul, by Paul refers to only one law, then certainly the apostle has contradicted himself. Here I will give two texts from his epistles which speak of the law that you all may plainly see the contradiction if but one law is meant. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5 in the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 5, and we want to go to verse 4. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4. And it says, Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. Ye are fallen from grace. Okay, now let's go to Romans chapter 2. Chapter 2 of Romans, and we want to go to verse 13. Romans 2, 13. It says, for not the hearers of the law are justified before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Has the Apostle Paul contradicted what he wrote to the Galatians in his letter to the Romans only two years later? Now, if you truly believe that the Bible is the word of God, then you will have to admit that this cannot be true, but it creates a problem. 
when the word law, as we should, um, w- excuse me, when we apply the word law, as we should, there is no contradiction. The language of the text and its connection will determine the application. When Paul speaks of the law in Romans chapter 2 verses 12 to 22, he refers to the moral law or the Ten Commandments of Exodus 20. This fact is settled in verses 21 and 22. Let's go there. Romans chapter 2 and starting with verse 12. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature those things contained in the law, these having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the mean while accusing or else excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel, behold, thou art called a Jew, and resist in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which hast the form of knowledge and the truth in the law. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a a man shouldest not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest, A man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? So here we have in these verses very clearly that he is speaking about the moral law. Now when Paul speaks of the law in Galatians 5 verse 4, He refers to the ceremonial law of Moses. Now let's go back there. I realize we just did just read this, but I want to go back again to Galatians chapter five. Galatians chapter five, but we're going to add something to it this time. We're going to expound on this picture just a little bit. Galatians chapter five, and let's go to verse one. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now, what is he talking about here with a yoke of bondage? Let's go to verse 4. Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, that is the ceremonial law, the law of feasts, ye are fallen from grace. So what he is saying here is if you are under this law of the ceremony, you are under a yoke of bondage. Now, today we have people groups who have claimed that they must continue with this ceremonial law. And according to Paul, he says that they are under a yoke of bondage. But then he also says, in 5 verse 4, he says, um, Whosoever you are justified by the law, that is, if you're justified by the ceremonial law, you are fallen from the grace of Jesus Christ our Lord. What happens if you're fallen from the grace of Jesus Christ? You have no salvation. Now that is a heavy thing. 
But that's what it says. Read verses 1 through 4, through 8. Actually, read the whole chapter. It's very plain. This is very clear. It is established by the fact that Paul is speaking of circumcision and eating with Gentiles and does not refer to the moral law with the chapter there that he's going through. And even the context from chapter 4, coming into that, he's talking about the ceremonial law. Now, Paul's letter to the Romans was written in A.D. 60. When we read what he says to them of the law, 27 years after the law of Moses was abolished and dead. So you see, Paul is realizing and he's making these bold statements that the law of ceremonies is a yoke of bondage. Now, if we go back to Romans chapter 7 and verse 12, it says, Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. What law is he talking about? He's talking about the moral law. The moral law. And I want to take a time to turn there. I read that and didn't give you time to get there. But let's go to Romans 7. Romans chapter 7. Because now I want to skip down to verse 14. Romans chapter 7. We just read verse 12. Let's go to 14. For we know that the law is spiritual. But I am carnal, sold under sin. Now let's go to verse 22. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. And verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I must serve the law of God. But with the flesh the law of sin. No one will say that Paul calls the law of Moses spiritual, holy, just and good. And that he delighted in it and served it 27 years after it was dead. Therefore, Paul is speaking of another law, the law of the Ten Commandments. This fact is made still more evident, if possible, by the seventh verse, where the apostle quotes the last commandment in the Decalogue, Romans 7 Verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. We're often referred to Romans 6 for proof that the law of God is dead. But it proves no such thing. Let's go to Romans chapter 7 and verse 6 now. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead, wherein we are held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. The law of God is the instrument to convict the sinner of sin and slay him, as it did Paul, that he might be justified and made alive through faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 9, For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6. Chapter 3 and verse 6. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. The letter, or the law, killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Now, in Romans chapter 3 and verse 31, it says, Do we then make void the law through faith? 
God forbid, yea, we establish the law. Any unprejudiced mind may see the two laws in the New Testament by careful searching for the truth. One is called the yoke of bondage. That's Galatians 5.1. The other is called the law of liber liberty. That's James 1, 25. So going back again, let's look at this and let's see and compare these things. Let's again go to Galatians, excuse me, chapter 5, verse 1. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now let's go to James, the book of James. We're going to go to James chapter 1 and verse 25. And it says, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, not a yoke of bondage, but of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. And then going over to chapter 2 and verse 8, that would be James 2, verse 8. If ye fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. One was the law of carnal ceremonies. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 10. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 10 which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of the reformation that even indicates a time of a reformation a change something new the other was the apostles delight holy just good and spiritual. So we have these two laws, the moral law and the ceremonial law. The difference be being between these laws is the moral law is the law of the Ten Commandments written with the finger of God on stone, which cannot be changed, and placed inside of the Ark of the Covenant. And then we have the ceremonial laws that were written by the hand of Moses and were placed on the outside of the Ark of the Covenant. So what happens if we continue with the ceremonial law today? So I want to go to Sketches from the Life of Paul, page 64, Paragraph 2. The Jews had prided themselves upon their divinely appointed services, and they, con they concluded that as God once specified the Hebrew manner of worship, it was impossible that he should ever authorize a change in any of its specifications. They decided that Christianity must connect itself with the Jewish laws and ceremonies. They were slow to discern to the end of that which had been abolished by the death of Christ, and to perceive that all their sacrificial offerings had but prefigured the death of the Son of God, in which type had met its antitype, rendering valueless the divinely appointed ceremonies and sacrifices of the Jewish religion. Now, that's pretty clear. I want to go on to the next paragraph. This is page 65, paragraph 1. Sketches from the life of Paul. Paul had prided himself upon his pharisaical strictness, but after the revelation of Christ to him on the road to Damascus, the mission of the Savior and his own work in the conversion of the Gentiles were plain to his mind. And he fully comprehended the difference between a living faith and a dead formalism, that yoke of bondage. 
Paul still claimed to be one of the children of Abraham and kept the Ten Commandments in letter and in spirit as faithfully as he had ever done before his conversion to Christianity. But he knew that the typical ceremonies must soon altogether cease since that which they had shadowed forth had come to pass and the light of the gospel was shedding its glory upon the Jewish religion, giving a new significance to its ancient rites. Okay. So we have this statement very, very clear. The sacrificial offerings, which were but a type, had met its antitype. Let's go to Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 268. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 268. Because the people of God had confused ideas of the ceremonial sacrificial offerings and, ha and had heathen traditions confounded with their ceremonial worship. So they already had some issues here. They had heathen traditions intermingled and mixed with their um, ceremonial services. Now, is there today some thing, a holiday we would call it, that has these two things mixed? We just passed it. Christmas. Now, tell me, what does a fat man going down a chimney have to do with Jesus being born in a manger? Now, isn't that a mixture of pagan and supposed Christianity, which, of course, is totally taken off balance, and we're not going into that today. But it is a mixture, making it entirely unsafe. Let's go back here to our quote. Because the people of God had confused ideas of the ceremonial sacrificial offerings and had heathen traditions confounded with their ceremonial worship, God condescended to give them definite directions that they might understand the true import of those sacrifices which were to last only till the Lamb of God should be slain who was the great antitype of all their sacrificial offerings. Pretty clear and plain. Let's see if it's common somewhere else. Let's go to Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 2. We've been in Sketches from the Life of Paul, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1. Now we're in Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 2, page 122. Page 122. This is starting with paragraph 2. We're going to go on to 123 here as well. Christ was the foundation and life of that temple. His crucifixion would virtually destroy it, the temple, because its services were typical of the future sacrifice of the Son of God. They pointed to the great antitype, which was Christ himself. When the Jews should accomplish their wicked purpose and do unto him what they listed from that day forth, sacrificial offerings and the services connected with them, pay closely attention to those words, the sacrificial offerings and the services connected with them would be valueless in the sight of God. For type would have met antitype in the perfect offerings of the Son of God. The whole priesthood was established to represent the mediatorial character and work of Christ. And the entire plan of sacrificial worship was a foreshadowing of the death of the Savior to redeem the world from sin. There would be no more need of burnt offerings and the blood of beasts when the great event toward which they had pointed for ages was consummated. The temple was Christ. Its services and ceremonies referred directly to him. What then must have been his feelings when he found it polluted by the spirit of avarice and extortion, a place of merchandise 
and traffic. Is there any idea, are you getting a glimpse as to why he was so upset when he saw what was going on in the temple precincts? Let's go on here. When Christ was crucified, the inner veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, which event signified that the ceremonial system of the sacrificial offerings was at an end forever. That the one great and final sacrifice was made in the Lamb of God slain for the sins of the world. Now, Let's look and evaluate this just for a moment. Therefore, if we are keeping the sacrificial services or the ceremonial laws today, we are rejecting the one that it is pointing to. I'll say that in straighter, simpler English. You keep the ceremonial feasts today, you have rejected Jesus Christ, the only one who can arrange for your salvation. We're talking about life and death. And that's just what I'm reading to you here. It's not my words. It's just what I'm sharing with you. What's here in the books. Let's go on. In the defilement and cleansing of the temple, we have a lesson for this time. The same spirit that existed among the Jews, leading them to substitute gain for godliness and outward pomp for inward piety, curses the Christian world today. It spreads like a defiling leprosy among the professed worshipers of God. Sacred things are brought down to a level with the vain matters of the world. We're going to go back to Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 3. So we've read Sketches, Life of Paul, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 2. We're in Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 3. Page 249, 249, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 3, uh, Paragraph 1. He lifted the veil from their understanding concerning the typical system of the Jews, and they now clearly and they now saw clearly the meaning of the forms and symbols which were virtually abolished by the death of Christ. Now, why would it say virtually abolished? That's simple. It's because these things were fulfilled and the final event will be fulfilled with that great supper in heaven. Let's look at another one here in this one. Um, 167. 167, uh, paragraph 1. When Christ died upon the cross of Calvary, a new and living way was opened to both Jew and Gentile. The Savior was henceforth to officiate as priest and advocate in the heaven of heavens. From henceforth, the blood of beasts offered for sin was valueless, for the Lamb of God had died for the sins of the world. That's pretty clear. Spare Prophecy, Volume 4. Let's go to page 269. Page 269. And we want to go to um, paragraph 1 here. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, paragraph, uh, to page 269, paragraph 1. Those who by faith follow Jesus in the great work of the atonement receive the benefits of his mediation in their behalf. But those who reject the light that brings to view this work of ministration are not benefited thereby. Now, who's rejecting it? There are those that are continuing to keep these ceremonial services. Those who reject the light that brings to view this work of ministration are not benefited thereby. The Jews who rejected the light given at Christ's first advent and refused to believe in him as the savior of the world could not receive pardon through him. When Jesus at his ascension entered by his own blood into the heavenly sanctuary to shed upon his disciples the blessings of his mediation, the Jews were left in total darkness to continue their useless sacrifices and offerings. This is page top of page 270, if you're in the book. The ministration of types and shadows had ceased. That door by which men had formerly found access to God was no longer opened. 
The Jews had refused to seek him in the only way whereby he could then be found through the ministration in the sanctuary in heaven. Therefore, they found no communion with God. To them, the door was shut. They had no knowledge of Christ as the true sacrifice and the only mediator before God. Hence, they could not receive the benefits of his mediation. The condition of the unbelieving Jews illustrates the condition of the careless and unbelieving among professed Christians who are willingly ignorant because they've chose to keep the feasts who are willingly ignorant of the work of our merciful high priest. And there's more to it than that. They're willingly ignorant that there are even two laws. They're rejecting the moral law as well. The whole Protestant world has done that. Now, I'm going to add to all of this a testimony of Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5. In the book of Matthew chapter 5. And we want to start on verse 17. Matthew chapter 5 and starting at verse 17. And it says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now remember that very carefully. By the way, I'm going to add something here right now at this point, give you something to think about while we read on for a moment. Hopefully you're thinking about what we're reading on as well. Don't want to exclude that. But if you look up the word law here in this verse, you will see that this word law is 3551 Strong's number. And it um, specifically means ceremonial. Do not think that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Let's go on. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now let's grab the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. They were keeping a ceremonial law that was now... Almost at this time, it was soon to be ended, fulfilled. Verse 21, you have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way first, be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer." And thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, thou shalt by no means come out thence till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. Ye have heard that it was said of them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whomsoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not 
that thy whole body should be cast into hell. It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, save, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Again, ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not for, forswear thyself, but shall perform unto the Lord thine oaths. Now today, we have many that are thinking that Jesus abolished and destroyed the law of the Ten Commandments. The very thing he has told them not to think. Jesus came today to fulfill the law. And the way to fulfill the law is to keep it. This Jesus did in keeping his father's commandments. So Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17. And the word law there is the Greek word 3551, which means, and I mentioned this a bit ago, which means to parcel out, especially food or grazing of animals. Law, the idea of perceptive general, generally law of Moses. Okay? So, also, in, verse, in uh, verse 18, the word law there, 3551 again, till all be fulfilled, is the same law, the law of Moses. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 19. Whoso therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least. When we go and look up commandments, Strong's uh, Greek word 1785, it says injunction, that is an authoritative prescription, commandment, precept. We've changed. See, it's simple. All we have to do is go and look just a little bit to see here that what it was fulfilled and what continues. Now, I want to go on to manuscript release. Manuscript release, page 196, par uh, paragraph 3 and 4. That's manuscript uh, number 21. Manuscript number 21, page 196, paragraph 3 and 4. Christ came to give an example of the perfect conformity uh, to the law of God, required of Adam, the first man, down to the last man that shall live on earth. He declares that his mission is not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it in perfecting in perfect and entire obedience, but to fulfill it in perfect and entire obedience. So the moral law is fulfilled by Christ's obedience to it. The ceremonial law is fulfilled by Christ's obedience to it. The moral law continues, as we just read even in his own words here in Matthew chapter 5, but we read that the ceremonial law is ended. It was fulfilled. Let's go on with our quote. In this way, he magnified the law and made it honorable. In his life, he revealed its spiritual nature. He revealed to heavenly beings, to worlds unfallen, to a disobedient, unthankful, unholy world that he fulfilled the far-reaching principles of the law. He came to demonstrate the fact that humanity allied by living faith to divinity can keep all God's commandments. The typical offerings pointed to Christ. And when the perfect sacrifice was made, the sacrificial offerings were no longer acceptable to God. Type met antitype in the death of the only begotten Son of God. Christ kept the ceremonial law. He kept the moral law. 
Therefore, he kept both laws and fulfilled them, but not in the same way. Let's go to the book of John. John chapter 15. John chapter 15 and verse 10. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Now, does that sound like a doing? Jesus, this is letters of red, Jesus speaking here. Does that sound like a doing away or a fulfilling of the commandments to where there's Christ is saying, don't need to keep these things anymore? Of course not. It's very clear. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. So what happens if we don't keep these commandments? We don't abide in the love. Very simple. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Matthew 5.18, which we already read, but I want to go back to again just for a moment. It says, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. These texts proves that all ten commandments in the moral law are to continue in full force. Not one relaxed, or taken away while heaven and earth remain. The next verse, verse 19 in Matthew 5, shows that Jesus was speaking of the Ten Commandments. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, I'm going to do something that I don't do very often. I'm going to read to you from another translation. Some of you may have never even heard of it. And I'm reading from this other translation because as I was searching and studying on this topic, part of what you have heard today is actually from James White. And James White shared this verse from the Campbell's translation, Matthew chapter 5, verse 19, from the Campbell's translation. It's a New Testament only. And I want you to hear it because not that I'm big supportive of other Bible translations, but I want you to hear the wording of this. I think it may help the understanding. Matthew chapter 5, verse 19, Campbell's translation. Whosoever therefore shall violate or teach others to violate, were it the least of these commandments, shall be in no esteem in the reign of heaven. But whosoever shall practice and teach them shall be highly esteemed in the reign of heaven. Matthew 5.19, Campbell's translation. The first four commandments on the first table of stone show man his duty to God. They are the great commandments in the law, as they are laws relating to man's duty to God. The last six on the second table show man's duty to his fellow man. They are the least commandments in the law, as they are laws relating to man's duty to his fellow man. Jesus here quotes three of these least commandments from the second table of stone, which establishes the fact without a shadow of a doubt that he is speaking of the Ten Commandments. We're going right back to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 21. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of hellfire. Commandment 1. Verse 27. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. It's the second commandment. The second one of these three. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 33. Again, 
Ye have heard that it hath been said of them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. Men teach for a few days that the moral law is abolished or that the fourth commandment is changed or relaxed. But how their false accus assertions and sophistry withers before the plain testimony of the Son of God who has said, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. Matthew 5.18 And how will we wither and fall in the day of slaughter and in the day of judgment for their teaching and for their mixing and mingling of these laws? For they either teach that the wrong law was done away with or fulfilled or they teach that the wrong law wasn't fulfilled and you still have to keep it. By the way, something interesting you will find about those who profess that you must continue to keep the ceremonial laws, you will discover that the moral law has little value to them. Literally. Oh, if you ask them, they'll, oh yes, I believe in the Ten Commandments. We keep, watch their fruits and you will see whether they believe in the moral law or not. Do not be deceived, my friends, by those who are trampling under their feet the holy law of God. Whether they are doing it by keeping the ceremonies or whether they're doing it by rejecting the law of the Ten Commandments. Do not, I beg you, let them turn you from the plain teachings of the Savior and His holy apostles in relation to the law of God. Even in the small things. Are you violating the fourth commandment, the Sabbath commandment in that law? Are you violating the second commandment? Are you violating the sixth commandment, the seventh commandment, the first commandment? If you are, today is the day to choose to no longer do it. The Sabbath law is on the side at the tables that was the great part of the law. Are you rejecting the law that the brightest light shines on? One part of it. Those who break the least will be of no esteem in the reign of heaven. How and where will you appear if you violate one of the greatest commandments? But what if you violate one of the least commandments? The commandments are on the side of men. Signs of the Times, July 31. Signs of the Times, July 31, 1901, paragraph 2. God has made known His will so plainly that none need error. He desires all to have a correct understanding of His law, to feel the power of its principles, for their eternal interests are here involved. God has made it so clear in His Word, that there's no reason for us to choose to be on the wrong side. Today we are living in a time when choices are being made. People all over are choosing whether they will walk with God or whether they will turn their backs and walk no more. Now, they still may be, those that have turned away to walk no more, still may be professing to be a Christian. But when they choose to go against the plain word of the Bible, they are choosing 
to go against the law. And if they do this, they are choosing what they will receive. Whether they receive salvation unto eternal life, or whether they receive damnation unto hell. I want to finish and leave you with this thought. Signs of the Times, April 1, 1880, Article A, page 29. Signs of the Times, April 1, 1880, Article A, paragraph 29. To those who obey them, the commandments of God are as a pillar of fire, lighting and leading the way to eternal salvation. But unto those who disregard them, they are as clouds of night. Make sure, my friend, that you follow the word clearly. For we need that pillar of fire, of protection. Because without that protection, the hosts of darkness will destroy us. Join me on your knees, seeking our Savior. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come to you wanting to recommit our lives today. To recommit ourselves to you. Forgive us where we have failed to keep your law. Where we have brought in the traditions of men in the place of the law of salvation. Cleanse us where we have not followed in a right path. We come to you pleading for that pillar of fire to stand guard about us, each one. For soon and very soon, we know that you will throw down that censer and that the work of judgment will be finished and that the plagues will all but utterly destroy. And we need that pillar of protection, that fire about us, that we be not consumed in that fire that is a thousand years late. Help us, direct us, and lead us unto life. In Jesus' name, amen.
walked the road to Calvary, gave his life so willingly, broken there the rose of Sharon, died for me, it was for me, he cried, for me he died, for me he shed his blood upon a tree, it was for me. Slay his weary body.